very uh, lovely. Let me just do the thing that ladies have to do at stand-up gigs, which is immediately adjust the mic to them. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really excited about writing this novel, and um, I'm very excited about doing it through Unbound. Um, yes, I hope the publishing world is paying attention, because uh, otherwise it's going to go the way of the music business, I think. <laughs> this is definitely the future, and so are you, so thank you for being here as well. Um, I've also been loving just sitting over there watching everyone try and be cool about the fact that there's a six foot Mickey Mouse with a massive erection. <laughs> but just sitting there, people watching around it, uh, tells you a lot about people. Hardeep has tried to fuck it. <laughs> so, uh, make out what you will. <laughs> Made love to it, sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway, I know that the evening's running on, so I'm, I'll just get cracking. I've written uh, the first bit of the novel. Well, it's not. it wouldn't be the first bit of the novel chronologically, but I have written an extract, which I was excited to write. And as, um, uh, as they said, it's on the uh, website on Friday, available for subscription. <coughs> and you can also subscribe tonight, I believe, to this and all the other books. So here we go. It's called Brenda Monk is Funny. Brenda Monk arrived at the gig early, hoping to clear and calm her jangling nerves, perhaps even take some psychological possession of the room before it took on a life of its own. A comedy club is like a feral animal that can spook easily, and she knew from her own observations of Jonathan and others that you don't just run in with a lasso screaming your head off and throwing your weight around. You had to crouch in the corner for a while, show it some respect, whispering silkily and gaining the room's trust before you could tie a rope gently round its neck and lead it quietly home. She had been to this particular venue in South London several times before, but only ever as Jonathan's girlfriend, waved in by the grinning security guard on the door, who always managed to emit this mixture of deference and amusement that made her nervous. Tonight he greeted her with the usual bouncing nod. Jonathan on his way? Mm. Brenda shook her head. No, not tonight. It's, uh, it's just me tonight. The bouncer frowned for a moment, but decided not to trouble himself too much with any further analysis. Analysis was not really his strong point. You enjoy the show then, love. Brenda hesitated, debating whether to correct him, but decided against. He'd find out in good time when he saw her on stage. And in any case, she didn't want to make this any more real than it already was. She passed through the heavy door and into the darkness. As her eyes adjusted, the smell was just as it always was. Rubber, inexplicably, stale alcohol and faintly toilets, although that could have been her imagination filling in the gaps left by the visuals. It made her queasy, not just because it was unpleasant in itself, although it was, but because it was an aroma suited to a busy room filled with drinkers come for a good night out. Under those circumstances, the stench was familiar, comforting even, but she didn't yet have a frame of reference for an empty room that smelt like this. Not quite empty, though. There was a girl in her late teens bent over behind the bar. She was wearing a black and red t-shirt bearing the name of some band that Brenda had never heard of, and her tight black jeans had slipped unflatteringly over her ass, revealing a pair of men's boxer shorts. She had dull oxblood red hair that didn't suit her, cut in a style that didn't suit her either. She had a badly pierced nose and a superior air, misplaced as it happened, but who was going to bother to tell her? Not Brenda. Not yet, anyway. Brenda had forgotten that this girl went with this venue. Every venue had its own version of her, but now she remembered their instant dislike for one another on the couple of occasions they'd met before. This girl had a bit of a thing for Jonathan, she now recalled, and had made extremely crude attempts to get and hold his attention when he had done gigs here in the past. The fact that Jonathan had both given and sustained his attention when it had been demanded by the girl was a source of great irritation to Brenda, who always then felt conflicted over whom she disliked the most, the girl or Jonathan. To be fair, upon later reflection, she usually found it was Jonathan. <laughs> the girl was currently engaged in emptying a dishwasher of glasses and stacking them on the shelf below the optics in preparation for the evening show. As Brenda approached, this metallic smell and cloying warmth of the steam from inside the dishwasher hit her full in the face like a vomit cloud. Brenda stopped for a moment and gagged. The girl looked up. Jonathan's not here, she said, and turned away. 
Yes, I know he's not, said Brenda. The girl shrugged. Broken up, have you? Is Martin out the back? Brenda asked. Dunno, it's a bit early for Martin. Okay, thanks. Brenda walked past the bar, fighting an urge to mess up the arty arrangement of beer mats advertising licorice flavoured shots, and went over to the matte black door laid discreetly into the matte black wall to the side of the stage. Ah yes, the stage. There it was. Four black blocks on steel legs, each around a foot high, jammed together in front of a heavy black drape. A microphone in a microphone stand, its long wire snaking away down to the side and off. And that was it. Nothing funny about this stage. Nothing funny at all. The only funny thing about this stage was who was on it. And in about an hour and a half, that would be Brenda, for a full 10 minutes. Within the rush that suddenly surged through her brain, she managed to note a tiny tingle, an as yet unpopped kernel of madness, a sliver of thrill. She would either make this stage funny tonight, or she would be enveloped in its silent blackness, buried alive in the softest of shrouds. She would either kill or die. For that was the language of stand-up comedy. And where she used to roll her eyes at the overblown, absurd masculinity of these warlike epithets, suddenly, in a white magnesium flare, she got it. She was a warrior, a gladiator, a mini-egg. Brenda turned round to find Martin standing behind her, holding a yellow bag of sugar-coated chocolate. Brenda took a handful and started crunching them hard, grateful for a new noise inside her brain. Still up for it, then? Martin raised a wiry grey eyebrow. Brenda tipped her chin to a scornful angle and sucked her teeth. Of course I am. Who do you think I am? <laughs> I'm going to fuck this place up. You'll never have seen anything like it in your life. You'll be begging me to stop before someone ruptures something. Martin raised a hand to stop the flow, and Brenda abruptly shut up. Aware she was now breathing heavily through her nose, she felt her breasts rising and falling. Too big, too big. Too cumbersome, not flat and swift and aerodynamic enough for this lark. And a redness creeping up around her neck. She was a fraud. She was sure they both knew it. And imitating the combative style of the more established stand-up comedians as they psyched each other out backstage only served to underline the point. This was a terrible mistake. She could leave now and no one would think any the less of her. Well, except for Brenda herself. But what did that matter? She'd let herself down before. Jesus, if you can't let yourself down from time to time, then we're all doomed and anyone who says different has clearly never been on a diet. Martin knew she would fail. It was obvious. She'd be on stage, the yawning silence threatening to swallow her whole. She'd forget all her jokes. Word would get out that she, Brenda Monk, Jonathan Capes, on, off, on, fuck buddies as an experiment, on, off, let's just try being friends for a bit, on, off, definitely now off, oops, on again, girlfriend, had actually thought she was funny. That would be the biggest laugh of the whole evening. She framed herself to turn and leave, just as the doors swung open and in swaggered Rossley Barnes, a rangy, long-haired Australian comedian in grey jeans, studded belt, large boots and a leather jacket whose own personal confidence, one from years of experience, appeared to know no bounds. Hey, Brenda. Is Jonathan on tonight, then? No. Brenda jumped as she heard her, come out, her voice come out deep and low with a strong West Country accent. Then she realised it was Martin talking. Brenda is. Rossi's reaction said it all. He pretended to collapse and die on the floor. It was a long, loud, drawn-out death, and when Brenda looked round, she could see the girl behind the bar laughing ostentatiously. Get up, Rossley. A woman pissed herself right there last week, Martin said. Rossley stopped and leapt to his feet. Brenda smiled at him sweetly, offering her hand as he steadied himself. So, you're going on, are you, sweetheart? Yep, so you better dust off your best jokes, or you're going to look pretty amateur. Strong words, female, strong words. No, Jonathan? No? Well, let me say this. If you're funny tonight, I'll fuck your brains out. How about that? <laughs> Rossley had a glint in his eye that was not unappealing. <laughs> he had a reputation for somehow getting away with the most profoundly crude material and not for nothing. Brenda looked at him, breathing in the thickened atmosphere produced by a combination of recklessness and control, the comedian's two principal weapons of choice. She could learn from Rossley. And if I'm not funny, he paused, perfect timing. That'll still fuck your brains out. <laughs> I'd say that's a pretty good deal for you, babe. And then Brenda started to feel excited. 
And for you too, she said. You get to fuck me either way. <laughs> either way, eh? Rossley arched an eyebrow. How about both ways? Brenda let out a shout of a laugh. Rossley regarded her for a second, assessing the impact of his little witticism, and then, having made a mental note of the gag and rated it according to his own personal criteria, he moved off with Martin, striking up a conversation about the running order. Brenda followed them to the, back, the matte black door in the matte black wall that led backstage and walked through. The door led straight into a small shabby room with a toilet room to one side and another door at the far end, beyond which lay an even smaller room that served as Martin's office, where Martin and Rossley were bending over the desk, scrutinising the order in which the comedians would go on. Brenda guessed that Rossley was trying to make sure he had the sweet spot. The first act on after the interval, when the crowd would be nicely warmed up, refreshed from a short break, but not too tired to listen and laugh. This was surely why Rossley had turned up early. A comedian of his calibre would never normally bother to arrive until half an hour or so before the show started, at the earliest. So Brenda idly wondered what his agenda was. Perhaps he knew something she didn't. Perhaps there was to be someone important in the audience that night. Next to the office was a man-sized space with a worn red velvet curtain hanging over it, slightly too short and too narrow, but big enough to enjoy a final hidden moment before stepping out into the full beam of the spotlight. The lack of a door here meant that the other comedians waiting their turn had to be quiet when the show was on, forced to listen to all the other acts, the triumphs and the tragedies. There was no escape from the pressing judgment of one's peers here, and the awareness of this silent hidden audience was probably the most intimidating aspect of performing at this particular club. In other, larger venues, the green room was a distance away from the stage with a door or two in between. At these places, the stage time was almost a relief from the constant scrutiny of other comics, as when they were not required by architecture to keep quiet, they lost interest in the gig itself and set out to good-naturedly destroy each other instead. Beyond the curtain was the left wing of the stage, beyond that a microphone and the unknown. At some stage in the club's history, a rather half-hearted attempt had been made to make this cramped, claustrophobic space feel like a comfortable green room for several acts, or a large dressing room for one, Perhaps when it was built, there had been a sweetly innocent plan to have local theatre groups perform Tom Stoppard plays here. But such an idea had been quickly stubbed out by the sheer force of economics. Stand-up comedy was cheap to put on and made a bomb at the bar. Local theatre groups required all kinds of expensive kit and attracted the kind of audiences that drank one slimline tonic and went home. There were two mirrors edged with like, naked bulbs or open sockets where the bulbs should be. They were never turned on. The room was lit instead by an old brown fringed table lamp on a small table in the far corner. It was dingy, but necessarily so, in order to avoid any bleeding of light onto the stage from under the curtain during showtime. Round the edge of three quarters of the room was a waist height sideboard where actors might lay out their makeup and good luck cards. But given that no actors had ever entered this room, and those comedians who considered makeup integral to their public image usually arrived with the mask intact, Along with the fact that a good luck card at a gig would be a sign of weakness and therefore an open in invitation to ridicule, there was nothing on this sideboard other than three or four stickily empty pint glasses, a barren ashtray or two, a hangover from the days when smoking was legal back here, and a mysterious dildo no one wished, wished to claim, remove or touch. There were a couple of cheap metal frame chairs with tatty red cushions half attached and two small matching sofas which may well have looked inviting at some point in the mid-1980s. The carpet was stained in various hues and damp in the corner next to the toilet room. The toilet room had no door as such, just a wooden screen that could be dragged across the entrance, although the comedians usually didn't bother, partly out of genuine laziness, partly out of a desire to appear unbothered by suburban concerns for propriety and privacy. In short, this was not the sort of place Joan Collins would feel able to prepare to meet her public. Brenda had been in this room a couple of times before, but only in her capacity as Jonathan's girlfriend. She had sat on the left sofa, trying to look self-sufficient and mildly disinterested, alert yet unimpressed, the demeanour of any comedian's girlfriend who knew the ropes. She had always felt she was there by invitation and could be ejected at any time. And so it had been important that her presence take up as little of the room as possible, but now it was different. Now she was an act. She had the right to be there on her own terms, so she must show she was worthy of it. 
She must expand to fill the space or be crushed by the others. If comedy was 80% confidence, she needed to increase her confidence by around 79%. Within the next, Brenda checked her watch, hour and 15 minutes. Rossby sauntered out of Martin's office. I've told Martin to put you on after me, babe, he announced. You're doing 10, right? Yeah, 10. You got 10? If I take it slowly, better to do an amaz fucking amazing 7 and leave him panting and fuck it up with a slow 10. Yeah, I know. It's not as if you're getting paid, so Martin doesn't give a shit in three minutes light. Do you, Matt? Martin looked up from the desk. Suits me better if she doesn't go on at all. Ludo always runs long when people start worrying about their trains once it gets on for 11 o'clock. Rusty nodded. There you are, babe. You don't even have to go on if you don't want to. <laughs> he left that hanging in the air like a malingering fart. <laughs> Brenda smiled. Rusty couldn't help but try to psych her out, throw her off her stride. It was instinctive. No point getting pouty about it. It was part of the game. No, I want to go on. I've got some new material I want to try out in an intimate club like this. You know, not so much pressure, eye contact with the front three rows. I like a small crowd. Brenda marvelled at the level of bullshit coming out of her mouth. Try new material? It was all new material. Sure you do, babe. Rosley smiled crookedly. He was sizing her up, not as competition, but as prey. Brenda smiled back, realising just in time that appearing confident was more important than feeling confident. Lesson one. Rosley broke the atmosphere by opening his bag, looking for the CD of music he wanted Martin to put on when he walked on stage. Brenda breathed out silently and felt for her small notebook in her jacket pocket. She sat down on the left sofa and pulling out a pen, she opened the book and started copying her set order onto the back of her hand. It was a waterproof pen, which meant that the set order would remain on the back of her hand for anything up to a week. <laughs> but at least it wouldn't rub off when she started sweating and she had already started sweating. The door to the green room swung open again and a stocky man in his early 40s grunted into the room. Rosalie glanced up. Hey, Mike, buddy, you look like shit. You got cancer or something? Mike Smith adjusted to the small but deliberate body blow and dumped his rucksack on the floor. It's full-blown AIDS, actually, Rosalie. I think I got it when your mum let me buttfuck her in Melbourne last year. Rosalie smirked and nodded and went back to looking for his CD. Brenda sniggered to herself. Mike noticed her sitting on the sofa and frowned. I thought Jonathan was in Birmingham tonight. He is, said Brenda. So... Mike looked at her with a quizzical expression. I'm going on. Brenda heard herself say these words and once again the reality lurched in her stomach like a bad prawn. She's got some new material she wants to try out, right, Bryn? Rosley's voice leaned into Mike's mounting confusion. Oh, right, I didn't know. I mean, I, I, did, I never realised. So you better not fuck it up tonight, Mike, because Brenda's bringing the good stuff. Mike narrowed his eyes for a fraction of a second. He'd been on the circuit for over 10 years now and never got above club level. Never even made it to headliner. To Mike, anyone was a threat, regardless of experience. Mike had seen enough people start after him, climb past him, and never glance back down the crevasse to see if he was okay. So he couldn't afford to be generous. Brenda just studied her hand while Mike walked into the toilet room and unbuttoned his awful black jeans. As the sound and smell of piss fermented on the long tube ride down from Acton filled the room. Brenda gagged again. Was this really what she wanted? Rosley's words played in her head. You don't even have to go on if you don't want to. Did she want to? Did she? She closed her eyes. She imagined getting up, making her excuses, walking out of the black door, through the bar, past the security guard and back out onto the street. She pictured hailing a cab and climbing in. She pictured telling the friendly fatherly cabbie her address and sitting back watching London slide past, not knowing, not asking, not caring, not judging. She would pay the cab, open her front door, slip inside and pour herself a glass of wine. She would put the TV on. She'd be home in time for The Apprentice if she left now. It would be as if this never happened. Martin wouldn't care, Mike would be relieved and Rusty would certainly find someone else to fuck whichever way he pleased. She was drifting in a sea of sweet relief when something gripped her inside, an unwelcome clench of regret and disappointment a feeling that her life would continue without her if she stepped off now. She could feel it rising, this knowledge that she was going to stay. She tried to push it down, but it wouldn't stop, and now all she could picture was herself sitting at home, bored, sadly downing a bottle of wine alone and wishing she was back at the club. She was gonna stay here, wait her turn and walk through the curtain, and with the screaming silence of the green room behind her, 
and the potential actual silence of the crowd in front of her, she was going to tell her jokes. Yes, she was going to tell her jokes tonight. So, um, thank you very much. The uh, subscription site for this will be up on Friday on Unbound. Um, uh, if you do subscribe, then the next bit of the story will be available for you to read immediately. Uh, but uh, here's a little clue, she dies on her ass. <laughs> But there's enough good stuff there for her to do another one. So uh, please do subscribe, if not for me, then for someone here, or perhaps all of us. But thanks very much. Good night.